Okay, these are the solutions for the work solutions to CCA's M8 exam, and this is from November 2023. Now, paper one is a non calculator paper. I'm going to go through it as quickly as we can and then on to paper two as well. So, paper one, first thing we have is we've got a binary question. It says 110110 is a binary number, 20 is a decimal number. Work out the total of the two numbers. So, the easiest way to do this. Convert your 110110 into a decimal, add the two numbers, and then convert back to binary. So first of all, I'm going to write out, uh, we've got 110110. So that is the one column, that's in the two column, that's the four column, that's the eight column, that's the 16 column, and that's the 32 column. Let me just change the size of this pen. So what you can see we have got, we've got 32, we've got 16, we've got four, we've got two. <clears throat> so if I was adding this, remember this is a non-calculator exam, I would pair those off, that's going to be uh, 16 plus 4 is 20, plus another 32 is going to be 52, plus another 2 is going to give me 54. So all those wee tricks are invaluable then uh, when we're doing this. So then we have 54 plus 20, remember 20 was the decimal number, that gave us 74. So we get a, got to write 74 in binary. So 74 would have uh, 64 would fit into it, 32 wouldn't fit into it, 16 wouldn't fit into it, 8 would fit into it, 64 plus 8 gives, takes you up to 72, uh, then 4 wouldn't fit into it, 2 would fit into it, and the 1 uh, wouldn't fit into it. So just check, 64 plus 8 is 72, plus another 2 is 74. So this one's switched on, this one's off, this one's off, this one's on, this one's off, this one's on, and this one's off. So that is our answer, 10010. One zero. That's the first question done. Three marks. Okay, now this one, I can't really do this one very well for you, unfortunately, on this thing. It says, use a ruler and a compass to construct perpendicular bisector from the point P to the line shown. Now, what you would do is you would open your compass up a certain amount. So, open your compass up maybe beyond this line, a good bit beyond this line, and then swing your compass round and make a mark. So, swing it round here and here and make a mark here and here. Uh, and then what you do is you, from here, you open your compass up a certain amount, and I would draw an arc like this, and then using the same thing from here and your same distance, open your compass up and draw a mark, and then that's what you will have. So what you should have drawn on your diagram, I get rid of those wee lines, so that's what you should have on your diagram, that sort of thing, and if I had done that correctly, uh, what would happen here would be this would link up to be a straight line. You can see it wouldn't be. So let me just draw what it should look like very roughly if I had done this uh, using the compass. You would have basically, that would be your line. Uh, you would have a point, uh, an arc here, an arc here, and then that from here, you would have another arc, and you would have another arc. So that's where they meet, and then that's that's where draw. So draw, draw an arc from uh, P, which cuts here, I'll call that A and that B, and then from A, draw an arc, and it's going to meet, it's going to uh, be this one here in yellow, and then from B, draw an arc, it's going to be this one in blue, and where they intersect, that's what you link up uh, to get your perpendicular bisector. Okay, so that's not great, that one, unfortunately, but it's the best I can do on this thing. Okay, next thing we've got, a sequence, lovely sequence question. We've got 7, 10, 13, and 16. It says, using the nth term, find the smallest term in the sequence above, which is bigger than 1,000. Show sure you're working out. So the first thing we're going to do is find the nth term. So if you go across, you can see here, it's going up in terms of in, uh, by 3 every time. So that means your nth term is 3n. And to find out what it is plus or minus, you go back. So I go back by 3 and what that gives me is 4. So my nth term is 3n plus 4. So I'd imagine you get a couple of marks for that. We want to find uh, the smallest term uh, such that the sequence term is bigger than 1,000. So we want to put 3n plus 4 greater than 1,000. Bring that 4 across, you'll have 1,000 minus 4. So 3n is greater than 999. Sorry, that's wrong. It's not 9996 at all. It is 996. And then we divide across by the 3. So 996 divided by 3 is going to be n is greater than, that's going to be 332. Uh, so 
The first thing that's bigger than that is 333 uh, uh, term, so the 330, uh, 33rd term, and that is it. So that's your answer, and that is it. Okay, next of all, I don't really know what this photograph adds to this thing. It says, the 1st of September is on a Sunday. Nina has applied to do a driving test in September. No test dates are given on a Saturday. Nina is unable to do her test on Mondays or Fridays due to work. What is the problem that Nina is given a test date that she cannot do? So basically, is it going to be a Monday or a Friday? That's what she's unable to do. Right, I'm just going to do out a bit of a uh, calendar here. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And we're told the first is a Sunday. That means the, the next Sunday is going to be 1 plus 7 is going to be 8. And 8 plus 7 is going to be 15. 15 plus 7 is going to be 22. Then it's going to be the 29th. 30 days has September. So the last day in September is the 30th. Now, all of these dates, doesn't really matter what they are, but all of those ones are out for us. So the first, uh, whoops, first four uh, Fridays, um, those Five Mondays are all out. So um, this one as well, we can get rid of this. So the test center isn't open on a Sunday. So let's just do dots for, for all the days that we're actually allowed. And we'll count them up. So we don't have to actually mark in uh, what they are as such. It's very unclear. Apologies for that. Uh, right. So there's the Fridays. And those Fridays, the test, uh, she cannot do anything. So all of these dots that we've left here, you've got uh, here, <coughs> pardon me, you've got four rows of six plus another one. So four rows of six, another one. You've got a total equals 25 uh, options here. Uh, but out of that, we want to find the ones that she can't do. So she can't do any of these ones here. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine that she can't do. So there's nine out of 25 that she cannot do. And that is our answer. Okay, next one, standard form question. And it says, work out the value of AB uh, over C. So let's just write that out, AB over C. A is 2.5 times 10 to the power of eight. B is 8 times 10 to the power of minus 2. And we're dividing by C, which is 5 times 10 to the power of 4. Okay, so to do this, non-calculator, 2.5 times 8. Uh, well, 5 times 8 would be 40, so 2.5 times 8 would be 20. 10 to the power of 8 times 10 to the power of minus 2 would be 10 to the power of 6. You're dividing by 5 times 10 to the power of 4. So 5 goes into 20 four times, and 10 to the power of 6 divided by 10 to the power of 4 is 10 squared. And have a look, just check. It is in standard form. This is a number between 1 and 10, so that is good. Happy days. We don't have to do any more changing, so it's 4 times 10 squared. Okay, it says A, a and B are similar pentagons. The length of each side of pentagon B is 3 quarters the length of the corresponding size of pentagon A. What is the fraction? Uh, what fraction of the area A is the area of B? Okay, so for length, this is about scale factor. For length, your scale factor K is equal to three quarters. For area, what you do is you square your scale factor. So square three, you get nine. Square 14, sorry, square 14, square four, you get uh, 16. So it's nine over 16. So if you get from A to B by multiplying, for length, if you get from A to B by multiplying by 3 over 4, you get from A to B's area by multiplying by 3 over 4 squared, which is 9 over 16. Okay, right, again, awkward enough for me to do on this thing. It says, draw a reflection of the triangle in line y equals minus x. So we're going to draw y equals minus x. I would learn off y equals x is the diagonal line going at 45 degrees, and y equals minus x is your diagonal line going at uh, 45 degrees, but the other way downwards. So learn those two things off, please. Very, very important uh, lines. They come up quite a lot, quite a bit. So there, here, and I've done this. I have no rule I'm doing this freehand just, which I shouldn't be doing. Um, so you should be doing this properly. Uh, so that's your line y equals minus x. 
To do a reflection, I'll zoom in on this, you count the number of diagonal squares to your line. So here, uh, make it a bit smaller again. Here, that's half a diagonal square. So it's going to take me to this point. Just mark on that point. And for diagonal ones, do every single point because it's very, uh, these are ones people get wrong all the time and they're very easy. So count the number of diagonal squares here. That was two diagonal squares. Two diagonal squares on the other side would take me to here. So there's another point and definitely do this last one as well. I'll do it in greens because it sort of goes over the top of this one. That's one, two and a half. Then there's my half and then one and two and that takes me to here. So, oops, I'll do it in blue. So, so there's my three points. And then link goes up with a straight line, straight edge, a ruler please. So not like I'm doing. And you can see that's what we have. Okay, another nice three marks in the bank. Okay, right, tricky enough, we question here, lovely questions, one of my favorite types of questions, direct proportion or proportion, uh, but they made it a wee bit difficult here. It says M is directly proportional to D squared. <coughs> M equals 36 when D is equal to three. Also says D is directly proportional to X, when D equals four when X equals two. Work out the value of M when X equals four. A lot of people will read this and just completely switch off. Just have a go at it, uh, and it's actually a very nice question. Okay, first thing it says is M is directly proportional to D, D squared. Sorry, so that's M is proportional to uh, D squared. Write that as M equals K D squared. Now it tells you, next bit of information tells you, when M is equal to 36, D is equal to three. So let's just put that in. 36 is equal to K times the three squared, which means 36 is equal to nine K. We better working out then. 36 divided by 9 is equal to k. So I always say to my, my folks, a good mathematician rewrites their equation once we find a constant. So we now have m is equal to 4d squared. Okay, right, half, half of it done basically. Let's go back and it says the next bit then. So we're on to this bit. I'll do this bit in green. This is a decent size, right? It says m is directly proportional to x. Sorry, D, if I could read, D is directly proportional to X. So we're just going to write D equals KX. And it also says D equals 4 when X equals 2. So that means 4 is equal to uh, K times 2. We better work out you're going to get your K is equal to 2, which means D is equal to 2X. All right. And the last bit, I'll do this in red. Uh, it says work out the value of m when x is equal to 4. So to do this, we're going to put x equal to 4 into that equation we have in green. So we'll just say when x equals 4, d is equal to 2 times 4, which, which means d equals 8. And then we're going to put d equals 8 into the m equation. So m equals 4 times 8. And that was 8 squared, which is going to be 4 times 8. 64 and then just work that out 4 times 64 is going to be 4 times 4 is 16 4 times the 6 is 24 add the 1 from the 16 you will get 256 so there you can see that one done so just believe in the method that you've been taught uh, undoubtedly so i uh, go with that and it's not too bad a question okay next one we have got it says the point 5a lies in a circle x squared plus y squared equals 50. Find the possible values of a. So we're just going to sub 5a into x squared plus y squared equals 50 and see what happens. So fire it in. You're going to have 5 squared plus a squared equals 50, which means 25 plus a squared is equal to 50. We bit of rearranging, bring that 25 across, it will subtract. A squared equals 25, which means A is equal to plus or minus the square root of 25, which we know is going to be A is equal to plus or minus 5. So your answer is plus 5 or minus 5. Next one says find the equation of the tangent to the circle at minus 1, 7. So a half decent diagram helps you in this. So what we're looking at here is we know this is the equation of a circle, which has a center of 
The extent or the origin, and it has a radius of square root of 50. The radius of square root of 50 is irrelevant, quite frankly, in this. It's the center uh, being the origin is what we care about. So let's just do a sketch of this circle. Not too shabby there. That's a pretty good circle. So there's my, my uh, circle. And then that sketch put on very roughly where this point is. So it's minus 1, minus 1, 7. So it's going to very roughly be up here. And that is find the equation of the tangent. So that's your tangent there, just touching your circle and no more. And what we're going to do to use find this is use the fact that we know what point a single point is on tangent, but we also know that the gradient of the ta sorry the tangent is perpendicular to that radius that I've just drawn on as a dash. So I'm just going to say gradient of the radius, and this is from my y difference over my x difference. Or you could say my rise over run, whatever way you want to set. And then that is going to be, uh, so it's going to be my 7 minus 0 over minus 1 minus 0. Uh, don't mind putting a bracket around that. And then that is going to work out to be minus 7. So that's my gradient of my radius. Now, my, therefore, my gradient of my tangent is the negative reciprocal of that. It's a negative reciprocal of that, which is just going to be 1 over 7. So my tangent is a straight line. So I'll just do that up here. So the tangent is y is equal to 1 over 7x plus c. So this is my y equals mx plus c, remember. And then we're going to sub in this point. So we're subbing in minus 1, 7. So that means when my y equals 7, my x equals minus 1, so 1 over 7 times minus 1 plus c. That's 7 is equal to minus 1 over 7 plus c. Bring that 1 over 7 across, it becomes plus 1 seventh, and that equals c, which means c is equal to 7 and 1 seventh. So my answer, rewrite your equation, y is equal to 1 over 7x plus 7 and 1 seventh for 3 marks. That's a lot of work for just 3 marks. Uh, but there you go. Okay, next question. Uh, change this into a fraction. Okay, right. This one, you, uh, have a look at this. What you've got, all three digits are, repeat, are repeating. So we've got in this one, the the number is 0.527, and it, all three of those things are repeating. Now, you are absolutely fine to just do write this one directly as this. So it's uh, that would be equal to 527 over 999, and that doesn't cancel down. So you're absolutely fine to do that in this case. Now, the only problem would be if you had one maybe like this. So it was two, sorry, uh, change up. It doesn't, it doesn't matter anyway, really. But uh, say it was 0.2527, and those three digits were repeating, then you would have to use this method I'm going to show you. But uh, So I'm just going to show you the long method here just in case you get a difficult one. So the long method then uh, would be 0 0.527, 527, dot, dot, dot. I'll just write that out. There's three digits repeating. So what you do is you, if, there's, if it's one digit repeating, you multiply by 10. Two digits repeating, you'd multiply by 100. Three digits repeating, you multiply by 1,000. So that's where we are here. So multiply up by 1,000, 1, you would get 527, 527, 527, 527, dot, dot, dot. And then very important, and this is the most important step, write your R underneath, but line up the decimal points. Okay, now if you do that, then you'll see when what you get, if you subtract, you'll get 999R is equal to, and what happens? That cancels, that cancels, that cancels, that cancels, that cancels, and that cancels, just leaving you 999R is equal to 527, which means r is equal to 527 over 999. And just check if that cancels down any. It doesn't, so that's your answer. Okay, right. Just to run through that again very quickly. If you got, for example, r is equal to 0.6 recurring, you could just write that straight away. That's the same as 6 over 9. Uh, and then make sure you cancel down two-thirds. If you got, for example, uh, R is equal to uh, 0.27, two digits repeating. You could just write that down as 27 over 99. 
there's everything, there's the whole thing's repeating, there's no, no extras. Uh, and then again, you cancel that down, what is top and bottom? Top and bottom divides by nine to give you three over 11, uh, and that's absolutely fine. But it's really, if you got one like that, R is equal to 0 0.2, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So the ones are recurring here. Uh, then you would need to multiply that one by 10 and get your 2.11111 and then write your R underneath it again, 0 0.211111 dot dot dot. Subtract, you would get 9R then equals and what happens here? Those ones cancel, those ones cancel, those ones cancel, everything cancels all the way along to here. So it ends up being 2.1 minus uh, 2.1 minus 0.2, which is 1, whoops, wrong color, which is 1.9, then r is equal to 1.9 over 9, then r is equal to what? You couldn't leave it the gap, multiply top and bottom by 10 to give you 19 over 90, okay? But for the rest of them, if it's easy, yes, by all means, just do it that way, uh, save yourself a wee bit of time. Okay, right, apologies for that mess. Right, next one says write down a value of 4 to the power of 3 over 2. Now, what this means, the number on the bottom line, this number here, means the root that you do, and then the number on the top means the power which you raise it to. And generally, 99 times out of 100, generally it's easier to, to make the uh, take the root first. So we're going to do the second root of 4. We don't really ever say that again anymore, but that's the way it used to be back in the day. Uh, so the second root of 4, we would just call that the square root of 4, but it means the same thing. Square root of 4 is 2, and then cube that, 2 times 2 times 2 is just 8, and that's all it is. Okay, number 11. It says the length of this, uh, the let space diagonal of a cube is 9 centimeters. Find the length of the side of the cube, giving your answer in the form A root B. Okay, right, the space diagonal. This is where learning your notes is so important. Past paper questions alone won't do it. Uh, so you've got to learn your notes. The space diagonal is a log diagonal. So it's from here, from front, bottom, left, to front, back, right. So you're going all the way from here to here. That's what you're doing. Now, in 3D, three dimensions, uh, that length, L, will be equal to the length of all the other sides uh, squared. So I'll just get rid of that. So we know that length was 9. So it's going to be x squared plus x squared, plus x squared, and then we will square root it. Okay, I'm not going to go into the detail of where that comes from, but that's uh, what it is. So let's just sort that out. That's 9 is equal to, that's 3x squared, and the square root of that. Right, we want to make x a subject. That's what we want to do in this. We want to get x equals something. So the two things, or three things, sorry, are happening to this. You're, we're squaring the uh, squaring the x, and then you're multiplying by 3, and then you're square rooting. So first thing we're going to do is the reverse of square rooting, which is squaring. 9 squared is 81, and then that just becomes 3x squared. Right, and then what have we got? We've 3x squared, divide the 81 by 3 to get x squared, which means 27 equals x squared. x then is equal to the square root of 27. And you could write that as the square root of 9 times the square root of 3. So x is equal to 3 root 3. And is that what we're looking for? Give your answer in the form uh, A root B. We have indeed happy days. So it is 3 root 3. Almost there. Three more questions uh, on this part of the paper anyway. Okay. Next one says, a box contains two bronze medals. Uh, six silver medals, so we've got two bronze, six silver, and three gold. So that is a total of two plus six is eight, plus three is 11, 11 in total. Uh, okay, and says, what is it probably, two medals are taken at random from the box, what is it probably are both silver? I am going to do a tree diagram for this, uh, make life a wee bit easier. Okay, we have got, and I should have made this a wee bit Smaller and clear that. Get that up to here and get that out of the way. Oops. I get rid of all of that. Sorry. Excuse me. So we've got that. So we have got bronze, silver, and gold. 
And again, you've got bronze, silver, and gold. Bronze, silver, and gold. Or here, bronze, silver, whoops, silver, and gold. Okay, two, two uh, bronze medals. There were two out of 11 to start with. Silvers, there were six out of 11. And then there were three golds out of 11. Now, you can't cancel these down anyway, but if you ha could cancel them down, I would not advise it. This is a one time we wouldn't do that because it makes it easier to see, right? If you pulled out a bronze, you had two to start with. You've only got one left out of 10. You still have six out of 10 silver and three out of 10 gold. So this time, if you pulled out a silver, you're now down to five out of 10 silver. You still have two out of 10 bronze and three out of 10 gold. If you pull out a gold, if you pulled out a gold then, let's make this a wee bit tighter, it's an absolute mess, all right. We had bronze, silver, and gold. It's even worse. And so you pulled out a gold, you're down to now two out of 10 gold. Then you've got six out of 10 silver and two out of 10 bronze. Now what we want, what is it probably are both silver? So both silver is this branch, silver and silver. So that's six over 10 times five over 10, let me get rid of that. So we're looking for six over 10, six over 11, sorry, times five over 10. I would just do that out, that's gonna be 30 over 110, which is the same as three over 11, that's as good as we can go. What we want is different metals. Uh, now I have done this out, different metals as being, um, I've worked them all out. So here, what I've done on this, and I've got an answer of 36 over 55. I've got an answer of 36 over 55. So I, by doing that, doing bronze and silver, bronze and gold, silver and bronze, silver and gold, gold and bronze, gold and silver. And I really should have done this. So uh, I'm gonna change it. I have done this, I'm gonna say probability different is everything except the probability of the same. And definitely this will make it easier. And I've already worked out both silver is both silver is three over twenty. So I'm gonna work out the probability of bronze and bronze and silver and silver. I've already got that one, and gold and gold. So bronze and bronze, you can see from my tree diagram of just squeezing this on is two over eleven times one over ten. My silver and silver was, uh, and I'm just I'm just going to write it out again at whatever it was. It was six over eleven times five over ten, and gold and gold would be three over eleven times two over ten. Notice I haven't cancelled down because we've got fractions. These all will have the same common denominator and make life easier. So I'm going to have two over one hundred and ten minus thirty over one hundred and ten minus six over one hundred and ten which is gonna be one minus, what's that gonna be? Two, 32, uh, 38 minus 38 over 110. 38 over 110, well, 110 minus 40 would be, um, would be 70. So then if it was only minus 38, it would be 72 over 110, which cancels down to be 36 over 55, which is what I had got doing it the slightly longer way. So I think that's a nicer way of doing it. So probability different is everything except one minus the probability that they're the same. Okay, uh, second last question, this one. You've got these two things. It says prove that only one of A, B, or C is irrational. So that's, I think, unfortunately, we just gotta work them out. So here you've got A is seven minus root five times seven plus root five. Now this is a difference of two squares, which is x minus y upon x plus y is equal to x squared minus y squared, which is gonna be 49 minus, and if you square root five, you get five, which is 45, which is a rational, rational number. Okay, now b, oh, b looks horrible. What have we got for b? We have got the square, sorry, we have seven minus root five minus seven plus root five, all squared. Okay, that uh, looks horrible, but that'll tidy up nicely. 
let's just write this, sort out this bracket again. Riddle brackets inside. You'll have 7 minus root 5, minus 7, minus root 5, and then that's all squared. So 7 minus 7 is 0. So what you've got is minus 2 root 5, and that's just squared. If you square that, square the 2, you'll get 4. Square root 5, you'll get 5, and that is 20, which is rational. Okay, so C must be the irrational one. Let's have a look and see. What we'll see, 14 root 10 over 7 root 2. Okay, if you have one like this, what you must do, well, in fact, we will not, we'll not have to do anything. I was going to say we'll rationalize the denominator. We don't have to. We're going to split up the root 10, write the root 10 as root 5 times root 2. Then we have 7 root 2. Now, you can see here the root 2 and the root 2 goes, and 7 goes into itself once, 7 goes into the 14 twice. So what you have is C is equal to 2 root 5 on the top. Uh, oh, sorry, that was a, apologies, that was a, wasn't a 14 at all, that was a, that was a 10. No, I'm wrong. It was 14. It was 14. Uh, 14. I was right what I had. Anyway, right. So what happens here? So I'll go through that again. You had, you had this. And then what you do is you rewrite that again. So change your root 10 can be written as root 5 upon root 2 over 7 root 2. And then what can happen is the root two's, root two's cancel, and 7 goes into itself once, 7 goes into 14 twice, and then that is just going to be on the top, is 2 root 5, which is irrational. So only one irrational. That was it. Okay, very last question. Very, very last question. Uh, we have got this. So this is really testing your understanding. It says A, B, and C are three uh, decimal uh, numbers, the graphs of root, sorry, of A root X, B root X. Let's start it again. A, B, and C are three decimal numbers. The graphs of A to the power of X, B to the power of X, and C to the power of X are sketched above. One of A, B, and C lies between 0, 0 0.2 and 0 0.6. One of A, B, and C lies between 0 0.8 and 1.2. One of A, B, and C lies between 1.4 and 1.8. Which uh, of A, B, C lies between 0 0.2 and 0 0.6? Okay. This would be the smallest of the things. So the smallest uh, of the things is going to be this one. So just to make this really easy here, uh, if, for example, I drew, uh, that's y is equal to 2 to the power of x. If I drew, that would be something like y is equal to 6 to the power of x. So as your number that you're raising in Farfax gets bigger, the graph goes up at a steeper thing, which means in our case, the smallest of these then uh, must be, that one must be uh, our, our thing. So which uh, of A, B, and C, so that must be C must be the smallest one. So the, this middle one then, so you've got, that's the smallest, that's the biggest. The middle one is uh, 0 0.8. Uh, between 0 0.8 and 1.2. So that middle one here is the y is equal to uh, b to the power of x. So I should have written that one as y is equal to c to the power of x. And then it says d is a decimal which lies between 2 and 2.4. So it's even bigger again than all of these. So just do another one that's even bigger again. So there's y is equal to d to the power of x. That's all you had to do uh, for that one. And that is the end of our first paper. I will do the next paper as well, which is our calculator paper. So what would happen in the exam? You'd come out, um, more likely leave the exam hall, go out, get your calculator, and come back in. A 15 minutes break or whatever, I'm not too sure. And then do the, sec uh, the second paper. So now, Okay, these are the solutions to paper two. And again, this is the calculator paper. So the first question, it says, simplify. Uh, this this could easily be on a non-calculator paper. Uh, so you've got an index number raised to a power. All you do is multiply the power. So it's going to be x to the power of 15. Question 2 says use trial improvement to find solutions to the equation. x squared plus x over 2 is equal to 15. So I'm just going to write down x. And then in here I'm going to write x squared 
with x over 2. And then I'm going to say comment. So comment is either going to be TB, so too big, or TS, too small. So first thing I put in was, um, was 3. So I put in 3. And 3 gave me, so when I, when I do that, 3 squared. So what I put in my calculator, by the way, is brackets 3 squared plus brackets 3 divided by 2. And then for every one of these, I'll just go in and I'll change the thing that's inside the bracket. So when I put that into my calculator, what I got was 5. And then that was uh, too small. So I'll try 4. When I put in 4, I got 18. And that was too big. Remember, my target is 15. I'm looking to get uh, 15 here. So it was too big. So you try halfway between. So try 3.5. That gave me 14, which is just too small. I'll try 3.6. That gave me 14.76, which is still just too small. Then I'll try 3.7. 3.7 gave me 15.54. So we're getting somewhere. That's too big. Now what I've shown then is I've shown, first of all, it's between 3 and 4. And you need to show those. So that's a whole number that's between. And now I know my answer. The one decimal place, my answer is either going to be 3.6 or 3.7. But to decide, what you must do is test 3.65, the halfway point. So when you test 3.65, I got 15.1475, which is still too big. So let's think about this. If 3.65 is too big, 3.7 would be way too big, which means my answer is 3.6 to 1 decimal place. Okay, next one says, Kate plays a throw the beanbag game. Uh, she records the number of times she gets the beanbag uh, in the bonus hole. So the total number of throws, so the total number of throws, so when she done te threw it 10 times, she got it in the, uh, the hole twice. 30 times it was 8, uh, 100 times it was 49, and 200 times it was 104. So... Write down the best estimate of the probability that Kate gets the beanbag in the bonus hole if she continues throwing. So the best estimate we've got is the 104 out of 200, which is then 50 or 200, which is 52 out of 100, which is 26 out of 50, which is the same as 13 over 25. I do not know if they would give you the marks for this. That's why I would always go on and cancel it down. Okay. Uh, why is that the best? As... It has been performed, the experiment has been performed the most times. So i just say as it has been, let's just say performed, perform an experiment, and that's, no, it's not an experiment here, performed the most times. Okay, Kate continues with our game and throws a total of 300 times. So we've got to just work with what we've got. Um, so it says, calculate the number of times you'd expect to get the beanbag in the bonus hole. So it was 13 over 25 is what we worked it out to be, times 300. And then you can just do that on your calculator, 156. And uh, so that's 156 times. Okay, the next one. Oh, and again, here, unfortunately, can't do this very well on my cut on this diagram. It says, position of two, uh, two airport control towers NB are shown. What is the bearing of B from A? So from A, what you do is you draw a north line, and then you link up using a straight line. You link this up, and that's B. And you want to find the bearing of B from A. So you're looking for this angle all the way around to here. So when I did that, I got 156 degrees. Next question says, two towers pick up a distress signal from a plane. The bearing of the plane from A is 110 degrees. The bearing of the plane from B is 50 degrees. Find the mark, find the mark position of the plane with a P on the diagram. So again, not great on this one. But from A, uh, from A, uh, it is uh, 100 and 110 degrees. So 110 degrees, very roughly, folks, is here. So that means this angle from here to here is 110 degrees. Uh, and then from B, so from B it was 50, 0, 5, 0. So again, draw your north line. Bearings, remember, uh, three figures given before the decimal point. And also uh, it is going clockwise. 
Uh, so 50 degrees, very roughly, is going like this. And then where they meet, so that was 50 degrees. And very roughly, that's where they meet at P. So you would draw that, measure that out properly. Uh, and you just do it. And that's that one done. Okay. Right. Where are we? Right. Pete ordered uh, cold meals and hot meals on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. On Monday, he got 16 cold meals and three hot meals. He paid £74. On Tuesday, he got 20 cold meals and seven hot meals and paid 112 And Wednesday, he got 10 cold meals and eight hot meals. Work out what Pete paid on Wednesday. Solution for trial improvement would not be accepted. Okay. We've got to use Monday. Got to use Monday's bit of information and Tuesday's bit of information to find out how much they pays for a hot meal and a cold meal. I'm just going to say X is for the cold and Y is for the hot, just because that's what I prefer using for my simultaneous equation. You could use C and H if you wanted. Uh, if your heart desires, that's fine. So for you've got 16 cold meals and three hot meals, and he pays 74 pounds. Dot dot dot. That's equation one. He also has got 20, and Tuesday he gets 20 cold and 7 hot, and he pays £112, and that's my equation too. Now here what we've got to do is simultaneous equations. We've got to make the number of something, I'm going to say to eliminate here, I think I'll eliminate my y. So i got to get the number of y's in both equations the same. So I'm going to, like if you had a third, and a seventh, you would take a common denominator of 21, and you would do that by multiplying the 3 by 7 and the 7 by 3. So same idea here. Multiply your equation 1 by 7, and notice I write this down first before I do anything else, and I'll multiply my equation 2 by 3. Okay, write that first. If people don't write that first, quite often what they do is they multiply the left-hand side, and then they forget what they were multiplying by, and they forget to multiply the right-hand side. So have that written down first. Hopefully it keeps you right. So 7 times the 16x is going to give you 112x. 7 times the 3 is going to give you 3y, sorry, is 21y. 7 times the 74, remember it's a calculator exam, 508, 518. Now 3 times your second equation would be 6, 60x plus 21y, and then 336. And then what we want to do is to get rid of the... The y's, we're going to subtract. So if you subtract, you will get 52x is equal to 182. And then dividing across, x then is equal to 182 divided by 52, which means x is equal to 3.5. Remember, it's money we're talking about, so £3.50. So a cold meal costs you £3.50. Sub that into equation 1, and I'm firing, firing it into my original equation 1. The numbers are slightly smaller, a wee bit easier then. That will become then 16 times £3.50 plus 3y is equal to 74. So that means 3y is equal to, and my calcul calculators are that good these days, just use the use it right as it is there. So 16 times £3.50, which means 3y is equal to, and that works out really nicely to be 18, which means y is equal to 18 divided by 3, y is 6 pounds. So a hot meal costs 6 pounds. Okay, we've now got to go back to Wednesday, and it says, and zoom in on Wednesday, on Wednesday he got 10 cold and 8 hot meals. What price does Pete pay on Wednesday? So 10 cold and 8 hot. So let's just write that in. Right, what have we got then? We know cold is this, and a hot is this. So 3 pounds 50 and a and uh, six pounds on Wednesday. He got ten lots of cold, and he got eight lots of hot. Fire that into your calculator, and when I did that, I got 83, 83 pounds. Six marks for that question. So a fair, a fair bit of marks for that one. Nice enough wee question. Okay, rearranging a formula. We've got this whole page for this question. I do not know why. Uh, so it says rearrange to make Z the subject of this thing. So you've got two things that are happening to my Z at the minute. It's being multiplied. I'll write that a wee bit bigger. Uh, it's being multiplied by Y and then you're square rooting. So the last thing I said was square rooting. So reverse it by squaring. So X squared equals Y Z. We want to make Z the subject. We want to get Z on its own. So divide across X squared 
x squared divided by y is equal to your z. And your last sign, just write that nicely. So then z, z is equal to x squared over y, and that is it. So x squared over y for two marks on that massive page. Right, next one. Oh, again, this is going to be awkward for me to draw on this one. And it says, describe fully the transformation which maps A to B. So A to B is clearly an enlargement. Because it's chain size. We need to work out the scale factor. And then we also need to work out the center. But three marks. If you can't get anything else, you can at least say it's an enlargement because it's chain size. Okay. A to B then. So let's look at this thing here, this length. You've got... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven and a half. So that's seven and a half. And then it goes down to three and a half. So that's 3.5. So just do 3.5 divided by 7.5. And if you do that on your calculus, just check. 3.5 divided by 7.5. Oh, okay. I've been a mistake. It's not three and a half at all. It's two and a half, is it? It's two and a half. Yep, 2.5. So it changes that. I should have said. 2.5, so 2.5, 2.5 divided by 7.5, and that is one third. So the scale factor bit is one third. Okay, so A, it makes A to B, it gets smaller. That's why it's going to be a fractional one. Okay, now again, uh, let's just do this then. Uh, to find the center of enlargement, link up the points. So this point goes to here. So link it up and continue your line. I probably won't need it as far as this. Same idea. This point goes to here. So link goes up and continue your line on. Okay, and you can see they cross here. So that's good. Now, if you do this correctly, the other two, this point goes to here. So link goes up. And you continue that on, and you can see where those three lines intersect. That's where your center of enlargement is. So what is that point? Two, three. And that's our answer. Two, three. Okay. Now it says, on the grid above, draw the enlargement of triangle B using center one, two, and scale factor minus two. So we're, what are we enlarging? Triangle B. Right. I'm going to get rid of those lines just because I'm going to make it very difficult for me to see this. Apologies, they're still there for your first one. Okay, my center was one, two, so one, two is here. Now mark that on, if it'll let me. Mark it on, put a wee circle around it. That's my center for enlargement, and I'm enlarging scale factor minus two. Now how we do a scale factor minus two is count your number of squares from your center for enlargement to your object, and it was one square, and then you go back the other way, so back the other way, one times two is uh, two. So you go back the other direction, so that takes me to that point. So that's where that point goes to. I would do every single point here. I wouldn't be trying to be clever about this at all. Uh, from this one, uh, here, I've gone, well, I've, if I was doing that one, I, to be honest with how I would do that one, you could just measure that and then multiply it by two. But I'd really be thinking, I've gone across one, I've gone left one, and up one and a half. So multiply two, I'm going to go across uh, two, and then down uh, three. Uh, but just check, and you can see there on the same line. So that's really how I would do that one. It's a nicer way than just drawing it. That's where that point goes to. And my last point, my last point, wherever my last point is, it's a nice one. It's just here. So diagonally one square, back diagonally two squares, and link those up. So that's link those three points up. So my three points were here, here, and here. And then link those up with a nice straight edge. And there you go. There you have it. So not very easy to see, but there we have done it anyway. Okay, next question we're on to, question eight. Question 8 says, uh, 8,000 pounds is invested at 3% per annum compound interest. Complete the formula for the amount uh, A after 
After n years, the interest was one three percent. So after every year it goes up by three percent. So it goes up to one hundred and three percent. One hundred three as a decimal is one point zero three. Calculate the total interest earned after four years. Okay, so the total amount after four years is going to be eight thousand times one point zero three to the power of four. I've already done this on my calculator. I got nine thousand and four pounds and seven. So that's my total. That means my interest is going to be 9,407 minus 8,000, which is just going to be 1,004 pounds and 7 pence. So always work to two decimal places with money problems. Okay, everybody's favorite next. Uh, we have got graphical solutions. So we've nothing on this page except a graph. Then it is the next page that tells us what we're to do. It says the graph of y equals x squared plus 3x minus 4 is drawn opposite. Use the graph to solve this thing. Okay. The whole idea of these questions is that that's the graph that you're drawing. You get it on the left-hand side. You rearrange your equation that they give you to get the, the equation of your graph on the left-hand side. And whatever's on the right-hand side, that's what you draw. Now here. That's my graph, and that's exactly the same as this. That means we draw whatever's on the right-hand side. So we draw this just, so here in this one, you draw y equals 2x minus 1. So we've got to go back to our graph and draw 2x minus 1. I, again, I should have had this done out properly. Uh, so 2x minus 1. So y equals 2x minus 1. That's a straight line which crosses at minus 1, so it crosses here and has a gradient of 2. So as I go across 1, I go up 2, cross 1 and up 2. I'm just going to mark a few points on that. Okay, so I use a straight line to draw this. I say that's what I'm doing. I'm not going to do it. I've got my straight line, my straight edge. Uh, so very roughly, that's what that line looks like. Now, what you do with that is you find where it crosses. So it crosses here. So you find that x value, and you find that x value. And just be careful with the scale here, please, folks. Um, so that's what you have. That's what you're doing. So you find, you draw y equals 2x minus 1, and you see where it crosses. And that's what your answer is going to be. So what I have done, what I got, and this is open to debate. You could uh, maybe get something slightly different as long as you've shown you're working out. But I got minus, sorry, x equals 1.3 and minus 2.3. It says, in its simplest form, what quadratic equation have you solved in equation 1? So our equation was x squared plus 3x minus 4 is equal to 2x minus 1. Bring that all to one side. You'll have x squared uh, plus 3x minus 2x is just going to be plus x. So 2x comes across and becomes negative, and you have minus 4 plus 1 would be minus 3 equals 0. So that's in its simplest form. Okay? Now, folks, what you could do, don't do this in this exam, but if you're wanting to check your answers, you need loads of time at the end, you could use your quadratic equation to solve that, and you should get something very similar to that. So if you're close to it, off close to it by like point, point 0.1, I'll be pretty confident in the answers to the point A part 1 we're correct then. Okay, next thing it says, use a graph to solve the equation. X squared, uh, let's just write down, x squared plus 3x minus 7 equals 0. Now write down your equation of your quadratic that you're given that was already drawn for you. That's what it was. Now how do you get from here to here? X squared are fine, good. 3x is fine. From minus 7 to minus 4, what you need to do is add 3. So you also need to do is you add 3 here give you this. So that means you would draw y equals 3. So we're going to go back to our graph and draw y equals 3. Again, apologies, I should have had this done already. Made it a lot nicer for everybody. So y equals 3 would be your line, horizontal line, which is going through 3 on your axes, on your y axis. And I'm looking for this x value and this x value. So we're just going to find what they are. And again, I've already done these out. So what I got was x equals minus 4.5 and x equals 
Okay. Last thing says, this last part of this question says, to solve the equation x squared minus x minus 5 equals 0, what line should be drawn? You don't actually have to draw it. It just asks, asks you what line would you draw. So you get your equation, write down the equation of the curve that was given, which was this. And then you think, how do I get from this to this? Okay, if you're at minus, the x squares are fine, clearly. If you're at minus x, you would need to add 4x. So we add 4x to the left-hand side. And you would also, if you're at minus 5, you need to add 1 to get up to minus 4. So that's what you would have. So what you would say is draw y equals 4x plus 1. So you would draw y equals 4x plus 1. Don't do this. It doesn't ask you to do it. But you would then go back to your thing. If you were to do this, just to show you what you would do, 4x plus 1 would cross here. Gradient of 4 means as I go up, cross 1, I go up 1. So very roughly, that's what you would draw. But you're not asked to do that in this particular question. So don't, don't bother. OK, how are we doing? We're on question 10, which is a probability question again. It says, each week, Tom plays a game of chess and a game of black, uh, backgammon. The probability that he will win the chess game is three fifths. When he wins the chess game, he must be on a roll. The probability that he will win black, backgammon is three sevenths. When he does not win the chess game, the probability he will win the black, uh, backgammon game is two sevenths. So draw a tree, tree diagram for this. Okay, so what is he? He plays chess and he plays backgammon. So he either wins, I'll say wins or or loses, wins or loses, and he wins or he loses. So probably wins his chess is three fists. So that means it probably loses is two fists. If you go back to the question and read, it says when he wins a chess game, the probability that he wins a uh, backgammon is three sevenths. We'll fill in the rest here. And when he does not win the chess game, the probability he wins his backgammon is only two sevenths. Now we can fill in these ones. So this one here is going to be four sevenths. And this one here is going to be five sevenths. And we are good to ask, answer whatever they could say. Draw a T-dragon to represent all the outcomes done and use it to find the probability that he wins at least one. Okay, so probability he wins at least one is everything except the probability that he uh, has no wins, so no W. So no Ws means he completely loses everything, so he, it's a long list branch. So it's actually the easiest way to do this. It's one over two over five, one minus, sorry, two over five, and five over seven. Calculator exam, you can do that in one go, but that works out to be uh, five over seven. Okay, question 11. Question 11, we have got this. Okay, simplify this thing. I'm going to write that square root of x as x to the power of a half, and then to the power of 4, and times x to the 3 over 2. Sort that out. x to the power of half to the power of 4 is the same as x to the 4 over 2. Just leave it to God, actually makes it easier. And then times x to the minus 3 over 2. And what you're doing is you're adding your power, so it's x to the power of 4 over 2 plus minus 3 over 2, which is the same as x to the power of a half. Okay. Right, this big shape is a cuboid with sides 3, 3, and 4 as shown. Calculate the angle between the space diagonal D and G. Similar to the question came up in the first paper. Uh, you have your space diagonal. So again, you need to know this. If you didn't know what that space diagonal was, that's a lot of marks in from the first and second paper you would lose out on. So to do this, it's all about right angle triangles. So that's a wee triangle there. That's a right angle triangle going along the base there. Uh, I want to draw this triangle out. So from uh, so that is, uh, that's what I need to do. I'll draw it out first, so from D to H up to G. And I only the only thing I know in this is 3. That's the angle I want to find. Uh, so I don't know what this, uh, I need to find another side. So I'm going to draw another triangle out. I'll come back to this triangle. 
So now it's a right angle triangle. I'm going to do the triangle that goes from D to C and then over to H, which is also a right angle triangle. It's on the base, you can imagine. And then that is 3 and that is 4. So by Pythagoras, and hopefully you know this one, the 3, 4, 5 triangle, that is equal to 5. Uh, so we'll just say, well, if you didn't know that one, just say, call that X. X is equal to 3 squared plus 4 squared and the square root. X is equal to 5. Okay, so we've got that X is 5. If we go back to our diagram, uh, so remember our original triangle, we can just put that in. We now know that DH is 5, that is 3, and that is the angle we're trying to find. So we'll just say that's from my D to my H to my G. So you'd say tan of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, which means theta is equal to tan to the minus 1 of 3 over 5. I'm squeezing this on, apologies, of 3 over 5. And then that works out to be 30.96 degrees, and that's the two decimal places, so 30. 96 degrees. Okay, happy days. Last question here. It says the area of uh, ABC is 16 centimeters squared. Find the length of BC. So this is what we're trying to find, and we also know that the area of this is 16 centimeters squared. Okay, area is equal to a half AB sine C. That's what we're looking for, but Understanding what that formula it means is very important. It's the area is equal to a half times the product of two sides and their included angle. So this angle in here, basically. So if I could say then the area we know is 16 is equal to half times one of the sides, which is 5, and the other side, which is 8, times sine of theta, we'll say. And then we better work out then that's going to be 16 half times 5 times 8. So that will work out to be just 20 times sine of theta. We better rearranging. Sine theta will be 16 over 20. No need to cancel that down. We are going to do sine to the minus 1 of that of 16 over 20. And I'm going to use this in my next part of the question. So I'm going to use this, give my answer to like five decimal places. So that's what I got when I did that. Okay. Now what we're going to do is find the length of BC. So we're going to use the cost, uh, cost rule to do this. We're going to use the cost rule to do this. So that means x squared will be equal to 5 squared plus 8 squared minus uh, 2 times the 5 times the 8. 2 times 5 times 8 times, oops, cos times cos of, and you can see I'm using this thing, 53.13010. Even better yet would be to use the answer that was on your calculator. It was 40.999, how many nines are? Five nines, nine, nine, seven, three, seven. Then your x worked out to be 6.40 centimeters, and that was the two decimal places. And that is us done.